Welcome to African Horror Stories. Have you ever heard of Buddhas? And no, I'm not talking about the Nepalese spiritual leader. Chances are, if you are from Ethiopia, or from any of the neighboring countries such as Sudan or Somalia, this name brings back some scary memories. For everyone else, let me explain. The term Buddha is synonymous with the evil eye, and it is said that people who wield this power can transform themselves into were hyenas whenever they wanted to. Crazy, right? Well, that's not all. One story by the Amara people dates all the way back to creation, and it goes that Eve gave birth to 30 children, and one day, God asked her to show him all her children. She was suspicious of his intentions, so she hid 15 of them. When he found out about this, he cursed the children to be Buddha as punishment. Of course, over the years, this story has completely changed. In the most widely believed version of the story, Buddha aren't just humans who can transform into hyenas, but they can also be hyenas who transform into humans. It was also believed that all blacksmiths were Buddha. Why blacksmiths, you ask? Well, some stories admit that it was a way of ideologically segregating the Ethiopian Jews, who at the time pretty much had the monopoly on blacksmithing. The reason for that is a whole other story and dates back to Bible times. Anyways, Ethiopian Christians accused the Jews of unearthing Christian corpses and consuming them. Buddha were also known to have a preference for children and lovers, often stalking and devouring both. So you can now understand why this name could trigger some memories for kids from those areas. Now, did I personally believe these stories? Hell no. <laughs> to me, it just sounded like a justification for treating the Ethiopian Jews badly. I like to consider myself an intelligent person, and of course I wasn't going to buy into some silly story parents told their kids to keep them from playing with the blacksmith's kids next door. Or so I thought. Anyways, my roommate at uni was Ethiopian. His name was Biruk, and he came from a tiny ass village called Atoga that apparently had a population of about 200 people. And he was always going on and on about these bloody creatures. He even swore that his friend had encountered one as a child and somehow survived to tell the tale. Yeah, right. You know that one person who magically survives what should be certain death? With absolutely no one around who can verify? What does he think this is? A movie? And look, I swear I'm not one of those people that are skeptical about everything. But come on, magical hyenas that eat lovers? Really? Moving on. I'm someone who loves to travel, and the African continent has always been really high on my list of places I wanted to travel through. Biruk had been here in Australia for about three years. He was an international student, and he hadn't been able to visit home in that time. Since he was constantly going on and on about how homesick he felt, we decided to kill two birds with one stone. We planned a trip to Ethiopia for our end of semester break. The plan was to spend one week in Baruch's village and then visit one or two other countries before we had to fly back. Of course his girlfriend whizzled her way into our trip. You couldn't pry her away from him if you tried. She didn't pay rent in our apartment, but I swear she was there more than I was. Great. Now I was going to be a third wheel on my own vacation. The day of our travel quickly came and we embarked on a journey that unknown to me at the time was going to change my entire life. We landed at the airport in Bahir Da and had to complete the rest of the trip by car. When you've been sitting in economy for almost 24 hours, a six hour car ride is not something you want to do. But Baruch didn't want to wait another day to see his family. So six painful hours later, we arrived at our destination and I have no idea what I'd pictured in my head from Baruch's stories, but it was not this. This place was a literal ghost town. Houses randomly distributed, a lot of them in bad conditions. As soon as Baruch and his mother laid eyes on each other, the waterworks started. It was such an emotional reunion. Everything was going great. Oh well, as great as it could be in such a small village, I was bored out of my mind. I had explored every possible place I could by now. I was counting down the days before our next location, Somalia. Three days into our visitation, Baruch had woken me up in the middle of the night to ask me if I could hear a certain cackling sound. His expression was a mix of terror and excitement. It's a wehaina, 
I swear it's a Wehina. See, I wasn't lying. I have no idea what this man was going on about. It sounded like a regular hyena to me, which was of no surprise considering where we were. On the evening before we were supposed to leave, Baruch and his girlfriend had gotten into a massive argument and at some point they left the house to talk. Two hours later and there was still no sign of them. But it's a small town, you know, so I didn't think there was anything to worry about. Four hours later, however, they still weren't back. His mother was starting to worry because it had gotten dark now. So I offered to go for a walk and see if I could find them. My guess was that they had just lost track of time. I hadn't even walked far when I heard the same cackling sound from the other night. One part of me immediately told me to go back because a hyena was not exactly a friendly animal and I didn't want to encounter it, especially considering there seemed to be absolutely no one else about. But the more curious side of me wanted to see it, just so I could shut Baruch up once and for all. So I quietly walked towards the sound. I had just come around the corner when I caught a glimpse of what looked like a hyena. He was eating something which I couldn't quite see. Any smart person would have turned around and gotten out of there as soon as they saw even a shadow. But not me. I stepped back and peered around the corner, trying to see exactly what it was. At this point, everything happened so fast and I witnessed two of the most frightening scenes of my life. <gasps> the hyena stood up, like a man. And what I saw was no ordinary hyena. Oh no, it had the demeanor of a man, but the terrifying teeth and face of a hyena. And it was looking directly at me. But that was not all. There was something caught in its teeth, and as it moves its head, I could see it in the moonlight, and I immediately recognized it. It was Baruch's necklace. Now I'm not sure how I am here telling this story because I'm pretty sure I passed out at that exact moment. I don't know how I'm not dead. I also know that nobody is going to believe this story. After all, why would you? The one person who magically survives what should be certain death with absolutely no one around who can verify. In fact, you're probably thinking, what does this guy think this is? A movie? Thank you so much for listening to today's story. I know there was no story last month. I'm sorry about that. I apologize. There will be one next month. So look out for that. As usual, please do not forget to rate and review the podcast on iTunes and any other platforms that you do listen on. Also, share with a friend and subscribe so you do not miss an episode. If there are any stories you would like to listen to, just send me an email at africanhorrorpodcast at gmail.com or check me out on Instagram at africanhorrorpodcast. Until next time, see ya.